Our next story is inspired by our executive producer, Rodney Miner, who recently became an advocate for prostate cancer. Veterans in Transition brought together veterans who have battled different forms of cancer to share their stories. Pastor Michael Bell introduces the keynote speaker. What will not be deleted from your minds, your memories, all of the presenters who've shared out of their souls, out of their hearts, you could not just hear them, but you could feel them. So this has been a day of great wealth for veterans. And again, I commend and thank you all for your services and the support group and network around you. Our presenter, the keynote, and he is Mr. Carl Sharperson, Jr., the veteran of the United States Marine Corps, stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's also quite an innovator, quite a leader, quite a strategist, has helped many organizations, has served in capacities of at least three Fortune 500 companies, as well as an international sports company and as a VP of manufacturing. 2000, he started his own business, his own company, his executive leadership, where he specializes in public speaking, team building, strategic planning, professional recruiting, and the list goes on and on and on. How gifted, how privileged we are to be under these next few moments as he pours out of the wealth and resources of his own knowledge, experience, and out of his heart to all of us. Put your hands together. Let's welcome Mr. Carl Sharperson. Good afternoon. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C., probably three miles from here. I actually went to my old neighborhood as I was coming in, River Terrace. My dad was a World War II Marine with the Mumford Point Marines, which were the Marines that were uh, Marines before they were integrated. And um, at the age of 14, he moved us to Spotsylvania, Virginia, 60 miles south of Washington, D.C. I went from an all-black environment to integrate in the school. During the same time period as the movie Remember the Titans, my experiences were very similar. Ninth grade, I go up for football for the first time. I'd never played tackle football before. I played touch football, I was fast, I could catch a ball, throw a ball, but I'd never played tackle football. So I go off for tackle football. Coach Sparks gives a talk that I'll never forget. He said, you got your pads today. If you don't want to play, turn in your pads. If you come back tomorrow, I need you to stay until the end of the season because quitters never win and winners never quit. He said, if you quit my football team, you might quit school. You quit school, get married, you might quit your spouse. Have kids, you might quit your, quit your kids because once you quit the first time, it's easier to quit the next time. So I developed a mindset that I was never going to quit. So I go out for football. Again, I'd never played tackle football before. Got my head bashed in, didn't have fun, didn't like it, but I was not going to quit. My sophomore year, I'm sweeping up the uh, locker room. Coach Sparks says, Carl, what do you want to do after high school? I said, I don't know, coach. He said, well, if you apply yourself, I will help you get an athletic scholarship. That was the first time in my mind I'd even thought of an athletic scholarship or going to college for free. My uh, senior year in high school, I was the most valuable player of the team. I played offensive, um, wide receiver, defensive back, and I was a place kicker. And I made All-American team and MVP, right? If I had quit, that never would have happened. So sometimes if you just hang in there, people will quit around you. My senior year in high school, I get called to the office. I don't know why I get called to the office. Me and two other guys that played ball with me. We go to the office. We're sitting down, we're talking to each other. Say, why, why are we at the office? In walks this guy, six foot two, 100, 230 pounds, blue suit, white shirt, blue tie, white cover, 
says, I'm from the Naval Academy, and I want to recruit you to play football. I graduated from high school in 1971. The Vietnam War was still going on. The other two guys said, you know what? I'm out of here. I am not going to Vietnam. So they left. I stayed and listened because my dad told me, never turn down an opportunity that you've never been offered. Always listen. So I listened. Went home and talked it over with him. He said, that's, that's a pretty good opportunity, son. Nobody else was knocking on the door saying, here's free money. Right? So I said, you know, I'm going for it. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to put everything in that I can to go. So I fill out all the applications. It's pretty daunting because in order to go to one of the service academies, you're talking SAT, 14, 1500. You're talking 90%. Uh, captains of a varsity football team, two, two different letters sometimes, 20% uh, Eagle Scouts. I mean, the, 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 the competition is just huge, right? So I never thought about doing that. So I couldn't go straight in. They sent me to a prep school in Harlington, Texas, called Marine Military Academy. Got on a plane for the first time. Went to the southern tip of Texas, played football, and learned to study for the first time. I didn't realize that in order to study, you look at a book, if you don't understand, you read the book again. If you don't understand, you read it again. I had never known that. I was good at, I was good in math, uh, and I, I was good in grammar. I didn't like to read, but I didn't know that. So I learned to study for the first time. I get my appointment to the Naval Academy. I'm in class, first class. Um, I'm taking chemistry, because everybody's an engineer at the Naval Academy, right? I'm taking chemistry, right? After about two weeks, it's clear that that instructor is talking French. And I don't understand French. So I go to the instructor. But before that, I cried myself at night and said, Lord, what am I going to do? Because I ain't getting this, right? Talk to the instructor. Uh, he talks it over a little bit. And then I understand a little bit more. But I committed that I was going to spend more time in chemistry than the other subjects put together. So I did that. I made a B in chemistry both semesters. Again, quitters never win and winners never quit. Played varsity football at the Naval Academy. Graduated, decided to go into the Marine Corps. Not only did I decide to go into the Marine Corps, I decided to become a pilot in the Marine Corps. First day of pilot school, ground school, you know what they tell you? They say the attrition rate is 66%, which means only one out of three of you guys, or, or it was all guys at the time, are going to graduate. What did I do? I looked to the left. I looked to the right. I said, Sorry, y'all not going to be here because I'm going to be here. Because Coach Sparks said, quitters never win. And winners never quit. So I'm going to be here. So I matriculate through that. Did five and a half years in the Marine Corps. Did two six-month Mediterranean cruises. One three-month cruise to the Carib. Got out. Decided to work for Procter & Gamble. I worked for Procter & Gamble for five and a half years. Manufacturing, engineering operations in Albany, Georgia, Cincinnati, Ohio. I worked for um, Frito-Lay for three years in Indianapolis, Indiana, making chips, Santitas, Tostitas, Doritos, all that kind of stuff. Then I went to work for uh, Colgate Palmolive in Topeka, Kansas, uh, as a plant manager for a union facility. That was the first time I'd ever worked in a union facility. Uh, work was in Topeka, Kansas for six years, uh, and then uh, got the calling to be closer to home. My parents were living in Virginia. My wife's from Florida, uh, and I got a job in uh, South Carolina. So that's kind of what brought me to South Carolina. Um, after about six, six months, to nine months, it became clear that my boss and I agreed to disagree when I, was, when I came to South Carolina, right? So after about a year, we departed ways. And I departed ways, and I said, what am I going to do? Well, I said, I can, I can speak, I can do consulting, I can do several things. So I hung out the shingle and started doing that in 2000. In uh, December 23rd, 2010, I go in for a routine colonoscopy. The doctor says everything looks good, no polyps, no nothing. I go to Florida to visit with my wife's family, uh, and all of a sudden my stomach starts hurting. I don't know what it is, but it starts hurting. Right? I can't lay on my stomach, can't lay on my back. Come back and talk to the doctor. I said, Doc, my stomach hurts. He said, well, uh, let me give you these pills. Came back a week, nothing. Let me give you these pills. Come back for a week, nothing. So. I finally came back, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do an x-ray of your stomach. So he does an x-ray of my stomach, and I get a call at work. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting at the desk. Uh, and he says, uh, Carl, um, I see enlarged 
lymph nodes in your stomach, and I'm going to refer you to an oncologist. First time I heard the C word. Anybody that's ever heard the C word? I thought about three things. Number one, how long am I going to be here? Number two, how am I going to spend my time, and who am I going to do it with? Those were the three things that went through my mind at that time. I didn't care about how much stuff I had. I didn't care about how much money I had in the bank. Those were the things that were going through my mind at that point in time. So what became important? Three things. I believe in the trilogy, right? So we three things again. Faith, family, and friends. Those were the top priorities. That other stuff didn't count. Faith, family, and friends. So I go see a specialist to do a bunch of tests. We're talking biopsies, PET scan, CAT scan, uh, bone marrow. It took about three weeks for all those tests that they were doing. It seems like it took two years. I mean, it, it seemed like forever. And at that, during that time period, I'm continuously getting sick, sicker and sicker and sicker. By the time I was diagnosed, I looked like I was seven months pregnant, sunken face, sunken arms, sunken legs. I looked like one of those starving kids from Africa. That's what I looked like by the time I was um, diagnosed. So I get the diagnosis, and uh, the diagnosis was stage four non hodgkins lymphoma. There is no stage five, right? So I can remember uh, meeting my um, um, caseworker. My wife and I go in and talk to the caseworker, and my wife's a little crying, and uh, the caseworker says, Carl, you can beat this thing. But you got to have a positive mind. you got to have a positive attitude in order to beat this thing. Again, quitters never win, and winners never quit. If you tell your body you're going to die, you will die. Your body's going to follow your mind, right? So I come in, like that, that, so that was the diagnosis, and uh, so then we got to deal with it, right? They give me the uh, treatment of six rounds of chemotherapy, three weeks apart. That was the, that was the uh, treatment plan. So I had a concoction of four different chemicals. I don't know the names of them. All I know is one of them was called the Red Devil. And the Red Devil is the one that takes your hair out. That's all I remember, the Red Devil. So I go through the, can go through the, uh, the chemo. But during that time period, there were some people that came along beside me. That was critical. Because it's all about relationships. There was a lady that lived up the street named Diane. Diane was a breast cancer survivor. Diane called me after I had my first chemotherapy treatment. And she said, Carl, I just want to tell you that while I was going through chemotherapy, I did what I called my chemo walk. She walked every day, even when she was going through chemotherapy. So I started doing that too, walking every day. I walked for the first time with a 14-year-old in the neighborhood. And we walked a block, two blocks, three blocks. Up to two, two, I got to walking up to, uh, to two hours you know, later on. But that was part of the, the therapy. But the other thing was this. When you're going through stuff and you, you're sitting in that um, chair getting the infusions, getting the chemo, all you got to do is, is you don't have nothing to do. It's just you and the Lord if you know the Lord. And old Slufa is just, he's talking all kinds of stuff. You can't do that. You're going to die saying all that stuff, right? So what I did was I did one of three things. I would say one of three scriptures. I would either say the Lord's Prayer, the Prayer of Jabez, or the 23rd Psalm. And I would just say it over and over and over. If I was sitting in the bed or lying in the bed and couldn't go to sleep, I'd say those verses over and over and over, Replace, replacing the negative with the positive. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I did that. Uh, so that was very instrumental in Diana telling me that. Okay, uh, I had another um, guy that graduated from Naval Academy with me, a guy named Stan. Right? Stan sent me a book. Stan sent me a book called "I Choose to Fight." The book is by a guy named Tommy Harper. Tommy Harper was a freshman when I was a sophomore at the Naval Academy. Tommy came in, played football, six foot three, two hundred thirty pounds, tight end. Tommy came to the Naval Academy, and he worked his way up to the depth chart as a freshman as the second string tight end when we were going to play Michigan. But during the summer, plebe summer, he had some issues. He was throwing up, his stomach was hurting, he was losing weight, all that stuff was going on. So the doctors told him, 
just before that game, he says, not only are you not going to play in that game, we're going to have to do emergency surgery on you. Tommy had surgery for testicular cancer. He was 19 years old, testicular cancer, right? They gave Tommy an 8% chance to live six months. That was the diagnosis. Now, this was in 1973. Can you imagine what chemotherapy was in 1973? He describes in his book, syringe in the arm. That's the chemo. Radiation, you go to a dark dungeon and sit in this cold dungeon and get zapped. So as Tommy's talking to me about what was going on in 1973, I'm thinking, shoot, if Tommy can go through that, I can go through what I'm going through. So that, that whole thing about hope is, is powerful and positive. And uh, so I went through that, and uh, Tommy ended up living until he was 55 years old. Had two kids. They said, you're going to die in six months, and you're not going to have a child. Right? So I'm going through this, I'm thinking, oh, Tommy. So anyway, so the other th person that came alongside me was uh, a guy named uh, Colonel Whitley. Colonel Whitley was a colonel, uh, and he was the head of my son and daughter's Air Force Junior ROTC program. And my wife and I were having breakfast one day. We hear this noise. We look out. We see these people doing some stuff. My wife looks again. That's Colonel Whitley and Miss Ann. Colonel Whitley uh, hired a, a lawn care service to do my lawns for an entire year. It's an entire year because we had developed a bond. We had developed a relationship, right? And that's one of the things that the military does. It's a common bond. Um, and then the other thing that happened was not only was I sick, I was broke. I was broke and sick. So I had to humble myself and say, I mean, I was, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I said, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, to just reach out. So I contacted a guy named Kevin. Kevin was the president of the Alumni Association at the Naval Academy. Kevin called a guy named Keith. Keith was a company mate of mine at the Naval Academy. Keith put together a GoFundMe program before GoFundMe was in existence. My classmates and alumni supported me financially for an entire year. An entire year. That's the brotherhood that you get because of relationships. Right? Now, the other thing that I found out, because I was getting treated at the VA in Columbia, South Carolina, there's this thing called contaminated water. Contaminated water, if you were in the Marine Corps and you were stationed at Camp Lejeune between 1986 and, no, 1956 and 1986, the Marine Corps was dumping solvents in six different wa water streams. So I put in a claim for that. Seven years later, I finally got some compensation. Finally got some compensation. So after six rounds of chemotherapy, I was diagnosed cancer-free, <laughs> only because of God, only because of God. So, through, throughout, so what I have done is I have written a book about my life. It's called Sharp Leadership, Overcome Adversity to Lead with Authenticity. It talks about my life. I call it a manual for overcoming adversity in any environment, in any stage of life. I've had a 10-year-old read it. 99-year-old great-great-grandmother read it. I had a 90-year-old 90 90 year Naval Academy graduate purchase 10, four for his sons, six for his grandsons. Bowie State just purchased 100 books for their, their uh, coaches coming on, on campus this year. I had a pastor use it as a Bible study. Um, there's a program at Clemson called Call Me Mister. I'm an honorary mister. They purchase all my books before somebody comes in the program. It's a program to get African-American males into elementary schools. Um, I had a 17-year Marine Corps veteran Got out of Marine Corps with post-traumatic stress disorder. Became a substance abuser, then he became homeless. Now he runs a shelter for homeless veterans. He said it's the first book he ever read from cover to cover in his life. My role and goal in life is to get that book and those principles in the hands of as many people as possible. What I have learned is everybody's been bullied at least some point in time in their life. You're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too black, you're too white, you're too something. Everybody's been bullied. Everybody's had um, some, some, some sickness in their life, death in their, in their, in their, in their home, uh, and everybody's had some challenges in life. So it relates to everybody. Now, so when you think about the military, I think about brotherhood or sisterhood. Or another way of saying it is, I am my brother's keeper. Or another way of saying it is, somebody already coined the term, 
he ain't heavy. He's my brother. That's it for this episode of Veterans in Transition. We ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time.